No. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for calling. Uh, we will have today Dr. Jonathan God. He is the uh, coordinator for the landslide program at the United States Geological Survey. Uh, for those of you who do not know, the UGS and NOAA have had a project uh, of uh, forecasting the brief flows in the two Southern California uh, weather forecast offices. And uh, that was something that started back in the 2005 uh, time frame. And uh, has been going on since then uh, quite successfully. So he's going to bring us up to date on, on the start of the program. Jonathan. Okay. All right. So thank you very much, Pedro. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to you all today. And I'm the, as Pedro said, I'm the program coordinator for the USGS Landslide Hazards Program. And I'll talk a little bit about the program itself, but we'll focus mostly on um, debris flow early warning and some of the scientific efforts that we've been pursuing to further that project and sort of the status of where things stand with the, uh, with the project there in Southern, Southern California. And in this slide here, I just start out with, whenever I talk about landslides, I often like to start out with the sort of the 31 flavors of landslides and that landslides come in a variety of flavors. And for a geologist, uh, landslides are any downslope movement of earth materials. So anything that makes it, that gravity's doing its work on. Um, but there are a couple types that are directly related to weather events and some that aren't really related at all. And the, in the upper left-hand corner, I've got an example there of some shallow landslides or, that have formed debris flows. Um, these are typically caused by heavy rainfall or earthquake shaking. Um, we'll focus on the rainfall-induced things here. That's a lot easier to forecast than earthquakes. Um, and in the lower left-hand photograph there, that's an example of a debris flow. And debris flow are these fast-moving landslides that, have, that move down uh, mountain channels, and they have sort of the consistency of wet concrete. And I'll show a video here if we can make it work of some experimental debris flows. But these are really the type of landslides that we are focused most on from a prediction standpoint, one, because they're tightly coupled with uh, rainfall activity, and two, because they, they present a threat to human activity and human life if you're in, in the way. In the upper right-hand corner, I've got a photograph there from western Colorado. That's a recent rock avalanche. It's about four kilometers long. It traveled probably 50 miles an hour and kill, unfortunately killed three people. Um, that's a, an example of a landslide that isn't tightly coupled with uh, rainfall activity. Hydrology certainly plays a role in its initiation and its movement, but looking at you know, the, the direct linkage between rainfall and, and that landslide occurrence is, a, I would say, a fool's errand. Um, in the lower right-hand fo photograph there is an example of rockfall activity. Any road cut or cliff face is subject to rockfall activity that's done in rock. Um, and these types of events, while rainfall and hydrology do influence their occurrence, it, the sort of predictive capability is pretty limited. Um, but just an example of the different types of landslides and some that are, that are tightly coupled to rainfall and others that aren't, <clears throat> or snowmelt for that matter. Um, Another slide here, just as sort of introductory material, landslide. This is a, a series of maps um, from 2003, 2007, and 2008. They're basically media accounts in the English language media of landslides that have occurred around the world. Um, and if they made media accounts, they either typically resulted in a loss of life or did significant damage. Um, and the takeaway message from this is landslides occur around the world, but they're concentrated in a number of areas. Um, particularly the fatal landslides and the places that stand out are places with high relief, high precipitation, and dense populations in the Himalayan arc and the Indonesian archipelago and Central and Latin America uh, tend to be some of the more heavily impacted areas. But landslides occur every year in mountainous areas. Um, we like to say gravity never sleeps and it's always doing its thing. So I mentioned debris flows and there are videos out there of debris flows that have occurred in the wild. Um, at the USGS, in cooperation with the Volcano Hazards Program, we've been producing debris flows experimentally. This is a little loud. 
But this facility is near Eugene, Oregon. Um, it's about a football field in length, and it's pitched at about a 30-degree slope, and it's an ideal place to run field-scale experiments. This particular experiment was looking at the effect of the, set, the water content of the sediment. And these are clear water flows over sediment that also create debris flows, and these are very similar to what you'd expect in a, in a post-fire landscape. But the takeaway message from both these videos are that water mixed with sediment carries a lot more momentum, speed, and destructive power than clear water flow alone does. And here's just an up-close view of that same video um, showing sort of what goes on in this environment. And our intern there, Kate, held her ground while the debris flow came down. Um, they edited out some of the expletives in this video, and you can imagine what they might be. <laughs> All right, great. But that just gives us a sense of the type of process, the destructive capability, and it's, it, what, what it is. Um, those are in, in, the, net, in the wild. Um, debris flows can be much, much bigger and much, much more destructive. Um, but the physics are, are roughly the same. So let's go to that slide four. There. Yeah, we just get to the next one. Oh, yeah. Um, just a real a quick bit about the USGS Landslide Hazards Program. It's a very small program. There are about 20 research scientists and engineers that are funded by the program um, and to a tune of about $3.5 million. It is a congressional line item as part of the Interior Appropriations Budget. Um, because the group is small, we tend, and it has a national footprint, we tend to focus primarily on research. And that research is to advance the understanding of landslide and landslide processes, and, and in particular the hydrology that drives the, the landslide occurrence and landslide propagation. A lot of this understanding comes from the real-time monitoring of both landslide movement and hydrology. That image there on the right is a colleague of mine, Rick LeHusen recently retired from the Cascade Volcano Observatory, and he's with a, an instrument package that can be delivered in a sling load in a helicopter, and on this particular setup, it has a GPS unit to measure displacement um, and a geophone to measure vibration, and I believe on that one there's a, also a piezometer to measure water table depth. Um, this understanding that's gained from monitoring physical processes and modeling those physical processes feeds into the development of a series and a suite of tools that can be used for landslide hazard assessment and forecast. And I'll talk about two of those tools a little bit more today. Um, one is here, an example on the lower left, is a map of an area of Southern California that's been recently burned by wildfire. And this map here depicts the likelihood and the likelihood of debris flow occurrence and where they'll be and sort of their volume as well. And I'll talk more about this system that is now operational that we do. It's one of the really the lone operational product that the program produces. Um, we do provide technical assistance to state, local, and international governments following landslide disasters. That's by request, and obviously we don't respond to all the landslides that occur in the United States or around the world, but for big disasters such as the recent earthquake in Nepal, um, we are asked by the State Department quite often to provide technical expertise um, for, you know, whomever needs it there on site. And so we had two people recently uh, in Nepal for about two weeks' time um, providing expertise both to the U.S. assets in country and to the, to the local folks there. Um, we do a little bit of communication, education, and outreach, sort of what I'm doing here today. So we try to cover all the bases that a USGS hazards program can do with a, what I'll say are quite limited resources. Um, I mentioned before in the very first slide that there are a set of landslides that have this clear link to storm precipitation or to the hydrology, and then there's a set of landslides that have a less clear link, or they, the link is ambiguous. On the left-hand side, I've got a couple examples there from uh, one, the upper photograph is from Brazil um, in a storm, I believe, in 2011 that generated widespread landsliding throughout that area uh, and resulting again in the loss of life. And then the other, the lower left-hand photograph is from uh, Japan, from Hiroshima Prefecture. That's a debris flow that's made its way down through uh, a village there and toppled a number of buildings and, and unfortunately killed a number of people. Um, yeah, this does sound like the death and destruction talk, as I realize it. On the right-hand side, I've got a couple, and the, the, the left-hand side landslide, there's a clear link between heavy rainfall 
or heavy precipitation and the landslide occurrence. So the, the link in time is quite close. Either the landslides occur while the heavy rainfall is occurring or they occur immediately after, within a few hours. On the right-hand side, we've got two examples of recent landslides there where there's not a clear link with the precipitation or even the hydrology. One is from Abi Barik, Afghanistan. Um, you may have heard about this, this landslide last year. It killed several thousand people um, in two different phases. Unfortunately, it killed a number of people who were, who were searching for loved ones who were buried by the first landslide, which is tragic in and of itself. And on the lower right-hand photograph is a slide that occurred in Oso, Washington. So this was in Washington State last year, March, um, that killed 43, 43 people. That's the, the deadliest landslide in the sort of conterminous U.S. Um, in recent history. And uh, that occurred on a sunny day. It, it, it had been kind of wet that month before the landslide occurred, but the landslide itself occurred on a clear, sunny day <coughs> on a Saturday morning which was about you know, one of the more unfortunate times to occur. So from a, from a hazards perspective or a risk reduction perspective, there, there are different strategies involved with the different types of landslides. Where there's a clear link to the hydrology and the precipitation, the risk reduction and the hazard reduction strategy, one of those strategies can be early warning, like, like we're doing in Southern California in cooperation with the Weather Service. Where the, the link is ambiguous, the risk reduction strategy is quite different. It's really avoidance. These things are largely unpredictable, at least with current capabilities, but they can be identified where they occur in the landscape and where they've occurred in the past in the landscape. So the, the risk reduction strategy is to just stay out of the way. Um, and I'll talk, I'm going to focus more on the early warning aspects than the, than the other parts of it. Um, but just to kind of close the loop there, where the link is less clear, like I said, the strategy is to identify, map, and estimate the frequency of activity. And the map on the upper left-hand side is just an example of the application of some remote sensing technologies to identify movement. This is interferometric synthetic aperture radar, and that's a number of landslides in California, and you can see where they're located and how, how much they've moved over the last year or so. But that, that's a, a way of identification, mapping, and then estimating their activity, and then you can take appropriate measures to reduce the risk of the threat from those. Um, the map on the right-hand side is sort of a longer time scale. This is really sort of a, a, a geologist interpretation of this river valley in Washington State where the Oso landslide occurred. That's outlined with the red hasher there. But if we look back, so since the last deglaci or since the last glaciation in this valley, which was give or take 12,000 years ago, um, we can sort of geomorphically interpret the level of activity about some of these landslides. We're older and some are newer, but this valley is full of landslides that all have occurred in the last 12,000 years. And so from that map, it would be very difficult to locate homes that, that wouldn't be affected by landsliding in the future, I guess is what I'll say. Um, but really what's needed here to, to improve in this is we need to advance our ability to monitor the movement, estimate the density and moisture content of these materials and, the, and, the, and what they travel over. To, to advance this hazard reduction strategy. What's more relevant to what this discussion today, though, is where the, ha the, the risk reduction strategy can, where early warning becomes possible from a risk reduction standpoint. And in the post-fire landscape, the coupling between heavy rainfall and debris flow occurrence is very immediate. Um, we have observations from throughout the Western United States, and I would say from around the world, that very sort of garden variety rainstorms can generate debris flows in burned landscapes. And that has to do with the fire's ability to remove the vegetation, which doesn't intercept rainfall anymore or, or hold the soil on the, on the hillside, and the changes in the physical properties of the superficial soils that allow them to be easily eroded. And because they're easily eroded from a broad section of the hill slope, they can get into those channels and develop debris flows. The chart on the upper right-hand side, and I'll talk a little bit more about intensity duration thresholds, but this is just a rainfall duration on the x-axis, rainfall amount on the y-axis, and in the red zone and the orange zone, we've got empirical observations that that amount of rainfall over that amount of time has generated debris flows in the past. And this is the type of criteria that's used by the Oxnard and the San Diego offices to provide early warning as part of their flash flood project. Um, 
Obviously, you need to know where the fires are and which basins are most at risk, and that map on the lower right-hand side is a tool that we've developed to do just that, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But this is all summarized, or at least this was summarized in 2005 in that document there that's the NOAA USGS Debris Flow Warning System Final Report, which uh, Pedro Restrepo is one of the authors, as am I, I guess. Um, but what are post-fire debris flows and how do they differ from other debris flows? By and large, in the western United States, they're generated through overland flow that then forms those nice little rills up there in the upper photographs that form bigger rills and then move into the main stream channel and really do some work. Um, it's tough to catch the scale on that photograph on the lower right-hand side, but that's eroded down about five meters into that channel, um, and all that sediment comes out at once and creates this slurry like we saw it from those experimental work we saw there before, and, and those obviously can be quite destructive. Um, <clears throat> the approach to better understanding all of this, again, comes back to this monitoring, or what we want to call sort of natural laboratories, and, and this is a, the research component of this cooperative project involves a lot of instrumentation <clears throat> of both the hillside and the stream channels to capture the, the rainfall that occurs nearby the landslide or nearby the debris flow and the, the soil moisture conditions and the channel conditions as the debris flow occurs. Um, <clears throat> just as a note, this type of equipment and this type of monitoring is not part of the early warning uh, system that, that is operated in Southern California. It turns out that the lead time and the amount of rainfall that can generate these things in, in these environments is so short that once you get the conditions or make the observation that a debris flow occurs, it's too late, it's over. You're not providing any useful warning to people. Um, this is, but this is what we learned from some of this, and this is just sort of a summary graph. So what we have on the x-axis here is time, and we're starting out here, so this is a few minutes of time, and then and stage on the left-hand y-axis and cumulative rainfall on the right-hand y-axis. And the cumulative rainfall is the red trace. I know water is blue. It should be blue trace. But anyway, the cumulative rainfall is the red trace, the 15-minute rainfall intensity in millimeters per hour is that green trace, and the stage in the channel is the blue trace. And our debris flow in this particular example, because we have video that observed it, occurred at that very first, immediately following that first pulse of rainfall. So the debris flows are generated within minutes after this intense rainfall occurred, and the average lag from a number of these observations between the 15-minute rainfall intensity and the debris flow occurrence is zero. So it's coincident with the heavy rainfall in these cases. And in this case, it's the first pulse of rainfall that occurred in this storm. Uh, this is from a, a monitoring site in Southern California, I forgot to mention. And this obviously provides some serious challenges to early warning. Um, providing people zero-minute lead time, as you all well know, isn't that useful. So the folks in Oxnard and, and San Diego have developed a process by which they're using both forecasted precipitation and observed upwind precipitation to, to identify and to issue this type of <coughs> alerts and early warning. So there are two operational products for this project. One, as I mentioned before, is this warning system. The other is a, is a mapping project. It's because you need to very specific information, geographic information on where these things are located or where the potential is high um, to do the, both the early warning and the mitigation side of things, we've developed a tool that I'll talk a little bit about to, to provide some, some mapping and, and a, a hazard assessment, basically. Um, but first, I'll talk about the rainfall threshold. This is another example. So we've got rainfall duration on the x-axis there in log scale and <clears throat> rainfall intensity on the y-axis. And this is just an example of <clears throat> three sort of criteria, a lower limit, which would be the lowest limit of where you might detect debris flows, an objective limit that we've developed a method to draw this through these types of data, and then an upper limit above which you're, you know that there's going to be debris flows. This type of information has been developed initially for Southern California, but we now have these types of thresholds, which could be used for early warning for the Colorado Front Range, um, Central New Mexico, 
and for parts of Arizona, which I don't have listed there on the slide. But this requires a rather intensive data gathering exercise. You have to have rainfall information and observation of debris flow occurrence that are in a pretty tight geographic location or proximity. Um, and we've been collaborating with state geological surveys and state departments of natural resources to collect this type of information um, that could, you know, ultimately be used to expand the NOAA USGS reflow early warning beyond Southern California. So what does it look like in Southern California? As I said before, this is based on these rainfall thresholds. And in Southern California, it's developed for three different geographic areas of Southern California, sort of for the peninsula ranges, the San Gabriel and San Bernardino Mountains, and then sort of the coast range or the transverse ranges to the north. And that map on the upper right-hand upper right hand part of the slide shows the, the different geographic or geophysical provinces, if you will, and separate thresholds have been developed for each of those regions. Um, Southern California is incredibly diverse, both topographically and culturally um, and, and geologically, and that's why this actually has three different, uh, three different rainfall thresholds. Um, the Weather Service incorporates this criteria that we've developed into the Flash Flood Monitoring Prediction System, FFMP, which I'm sure you're all much more familiar with than I am. And then the forecasters in those two weather forecast offices, offices monitor both the rainfall intensity compared to the USGS thresholds and this map, which I'll talk about in a moment, about where these locations are um, to issue those as part of the Flash Flood products in those WFOs. Um, the, where we've made some pretty big strides in the last year or so is taking a spatial assessment of debris flow probability and debris flow magnitude or volume and pushing that from a scientific report-based system to a web-based delivery system. So what used to take months now takes days um, because the process has been peer-reviewed and, and applied to a number of regions. And so I'll talk just a bit about that. But the, the model itself has two major components, a where component, what's the likelihood of a debris flow to occur in a given basin, and then a, a how big or a magnitude component, which is a, a, a debris flow volume estimate. Um, we got some feedback from our customers, including the National Weather Service, that the paper-based reports that we were producing just weren't all that useful. And this is a modern world, so we needed to move to a geospatial data delivery and uh, the timeliness aspect of it. So these reports were coming out months <clears throat> rather than days after. So in often cases, while it's rainfall that puts out the fires and creates debris flow, so we needed to get ahead of what happened. So we developed this web interface here that produces an interactive map and also has GIS files available for download. Um, this is an example of, of uh, one of the maps that was produced, or one of the web pages that was produced for the Colby fire, which occurred in Los Angeles in January. That gives you a sense of how bad the drought has been out there. But it looks a little bit like this. Um, this is just a zoom in to one of these maps. The red colors indicate the probability of a debris flow occurring, and this is based on empirical data of topography and underlying geology and uh, rainfall, so this is done for a scenario rainfall. <clears throat> and this indicates that the probability in those red areas is, you know, greater than 60%. In the yellow basins, it's, it's lower than 40%, for example. And it has a little toggle tool. You can zoom in and zoom out on your basin um, on this web application. And it also has different layers that are provided in here. And one of those is this basin probability. Um, which I just talked about. And another one is a segment probability. So this, instead of looking at the catchment as a whole, of course, the debris flows are going to be concentrated <coughs> in the stream channel. So this is just provides another way to depict that. Um, there's also volume estimates and then a combined hazard rating, which is just sort of a convolution of those two things to give us the worst space. And the worst, if you want to look at it from that perspective, and some of the users like to look at it that. The other client for this type of product are burned area uh, recovery, so-called bear teams that go in after recently burned areas and, and do diff different mitigation works and, and different advisory works for the emergency management community in, in the area. So I mentioned before the feedback that we had gotten from our partners and our colleagues 
was that, you know, these paper maps taking months to turn around um, weren't that useful. And so that timeline up there is sort of the timeline of the past. Um, on the left-hand bar there, there's sort of the day zeros when the process was begun. Um, we'd get the request from the, in this case, the bear team, which was a forest service bear team. Um, it would take quite a few days to produce the preliminary maps and then submit those for review and the USGS process being what it is, some months later there would be a report that comes out that could be used by these folks and that turned out to be not so great. In the new process we are doing it much faster, that's just a, time, a typical timeline that we're experiencing now and we're really leveraging off uh, technologies and other processes developed by the Earthquake Hazards Program for a number of their tools that are d disseminated online to reduce the availability of these products down to days. And this, that lower timeline chart depicts that. Um, it's probably quite conservative, the, the most recent one. Yep, Pedro. Now, what is the buyer? BK? Oh, B Burned Area Emergency oh. Response. So it's a U.S. Forest Service Department of Interior effort to do mitigation works for burned areas. So they do all the hydro mulching and all that kind of stuff. And they provide better reports to the local emergency management folks who manage the areas. So, Thanks. Yeah. Um, just our typical turnaround time in the last few, one, few of these that we've done is down to about 48 hours. So depending on when the fire occurs and who happens to be on leave. Um, <clears throat> right now we're we have two models. One is the Intermountain West model for these products, and another one is the Southern California model. Um, those dots on the map are areas where are fires where we've got debris flow occurrence, rainfall information, and uh, a tool basically to do to do these maps and then to develop. Um, we, as, as you may or may not be aware, the Pacific Northwest has suffered this tremendous drought in the last few years, and so we've actually had fires in the Coast Range of both Oregon and Washington. There was a, actually a big fire on the Olympic Peninsula, incredibly, in the, um, in the rainforest. And they have been asking for assessments like this, but we, we're not sure we can extend to that, to that part of the world. But we are cooperating with folks out there to try to better understand uh, the debris flow potential after wildfires in, in those environments. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit now to talk not about what is sort of operational, but where I think the research is going and as this is a product that you all produce, uh, the Weather Service produces their quantitative precipitation forecast. <clears throat> for many parts of the world, I would say for most parts of the world and most, certainly most parts of the mountainous parts of the United States, we have no idea what rainfall, the, the rainfall threshold might be to produce debris flows. Um, but we do have some physical process understanding that could be applied to, to, to do early warning. And one of the key components of that would be obviously a, a forecasted rainfall amount. If we had reasonably accurate forecasted rainfall amounts and we knew something about the physical properties of the material and importantly we had instrumentation in the ground like some of that what I was talking before, I think early warning for non-fire related debris flows is possible and I'll talk a little bit about how we've done that and that's sort of where I spent my last 10 years sort of trying to better understand those physical processes. But this is just one of the products and this illustrated of, you know, for that you all produce that would be inputs to some system like this. And obviously you're producing higher resolution things here. This is just a map of Western Oregon, or excuse me, of the state of Oregon from a forecast. And I don't know, recall exactly when it is, but you know, you're forecasting something like five or 10 inches of rainfall in the coast range of Oregon. Um, past experience tells us that, that 10, inch, 10 inches of rainfall in the coast range of Oregon over a 24-hour period or whatever it is, is going to cause problems from a landslide perspective. So can these be used to, to leverage some of the landslide understanding for early warning? Um, <clears throat> I mentioned that rainfall thresholds are, for most of the world, are unknown. What uh, rainfall thresholds that generate landslides are, are poorly known. But the one thing that is known is that they spread over a very, very large range of rainfall intensity and duration. So across the x-axis, again, is rainfall duration in hours on log scale. And on the y-axis, we've got rainfall intensity, again, in log scale. These are both in millimeters per hour, or that's in millimeters per hour. And just for uh, several places around the world that I've highlighted, 
uh, the San Francisco Bay region, the Oregon Coast Range, um, a very site-specific area in La Honda, California, which is not too far in San Mateo County, Seattle, Washington, and Metman Ridge, Oregon. Um, and the takeaway message from this graph is that these rainfall thresholds vary over several orders of magnitude, both in rainfall intensity and in duration. That says a couple of things. One, it's a very challenging predictive endeavor, but it also says that there's, there's something about the physical properties of the material and the physical process itself that controls this very wide range of observed rainfall intensity and duration. And we spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. Um, <clears throat> and we worked on a, a, some, some models, um, but this is, is from a conceptual basis. A physics-based early warning requires the knowledge of the, of the materials that the rainfall and the landslide is going to occur in. And I've just got a little diagram here highlighting that the hydrology can piece piece out is extremely important. Um, and the weather predictions and observations from on the hillside would feed together to give us the quantitative understanding of the hydrology that would allow us to do that prediction. Um, and that figure up there in the upper left is just a conceptual sketch of, of a model I'll talk about real briefly that we've developed. Um, but again, coming back to this need for in-situ information to do quantitative forecasting. So if you think of it from a weather forecasting perspective, you've got weather balloons and radar observations and rain gauge observations and all this other stuff that you use to <coughs> sort of initialize and calibrate models against. We would use soil moisture movement and soil suction, so hyd hydrologic measurement, to, 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 to train those models or to, or to calibrate those models. This is just some examples of things that we've done to try to better understand that. Um, I'm going to talk about an example from, from Seattle, Washington, where we've had some instrumentation in the ground and a tool that we've developed and modeling we've done to try to do just this sort of prediction. But the, the objective was to try to provide alerts at least days in advance. If you want people to do something, and you, all, you know this all too well, you need to provide them a sufficient lead time. And if we're talking about emergency managers, positioning equipment or positioning people to respond to these things, they need, they need some significant lead time. Um, ideally, it would be used to supplement rainfall thresholds so we'd have some empirical understanding to work from as a basis, um, but reiterating that the field monitoring data are critical to initialize any of these sort of hydrologic models that are used for this. Um, and I'll talk about this case study from a very similar setting to this setting on the right-hand side. This is Bainbridge Island, Washington in 1997, where a slide occurred off of a, a coastal bluff that, damn it, that hit that house and unfortunately killed a family of four. Um, but where we've been working and we're continuing to work is on this rail corridor between Seattle, Washington and Everett, Washington. This is a heavily traveled rail, rail corridor along a bluff along the Puget Sound. Um, this is a glacial layer take, um, not that dissimilar from here in Minneapolis in the Minnesota area. Um, but you've got a sort of a, a lower unit of glacial lacustrine clay and silt, uh, a middle unit of sand, which is in some places 300 feet thick, and then a, a capping till. Um, but, it, but it's by and large sand. And that, that material weathers, mechanically weathers into a colluvial mantle that drapes over these bluffs that fails in heavy rainfall with astonishing frequency <laughs> in this part of the world. Um, and we've collaborated with Burlington Northern Santa Fe and Sound Transit to develop an early warning system along this rail corridor for rail operations. Um, there's both freight rail and passenger rail and they're moving something like 20,000 people a day up and down this rail corridor. So when, the, when a landslide occurs and blocks the tracks, they close the tracks for 48 hours for passenger travel. They would very much like to reduce the amount of time that they can close the train, train tracks. So the initial emphasis is not so much on providing early warning for a landslide to occur, but the emphasis on is there, can they reopen the tracks sooner than, than 48 hours. Um, this is another video just to illustrate what goes on. Um, 
This is a video sh shot near Everett, Washington by a dock worker who I, which I saw on YouTube, and then I contacted him directly and he sent me the slide. But this is a slide that occurred. This is a slide that occurred on this coastal bluff a, a few hours after there was heavy rainfall. And there's actually another slide that's just out of frame, um, kind of up track from this. And it gives us an illustration of sort of the problem we're, we're chasing, I guess. Um, and sort of the, I mean, what is a very modest hill slope, I think the relief here is 75 feet or maybe 100 feet. Um, the slide itself, when you see it, only travels a short distance. But uh, it creates some problems for rail operations in the area. And I think the effort has been edited out of this video as well. Fortunately or unfortunately. <laughs> so yeah, that's so that's that's the type of thing um, that occurs along this, this section of track. Um, we've had a series of monitoring sites that are up and down the rail corridor here. We actually had monitoring equipment in this slope, but it was partially decommissioned prior to this landslide, unfortunately. But we did catch a slide that occurred um, a, a couple years before this down a, a bit further south. Um, it was near Edmonds, Washington, where we had a field monitoring site, and that map on the right-hand side shows the location both of a landslide and our monitoring equipment. Um, it's an oblique view of a LIDAR train map, so you can get kind of the sense of the relief there. You can see the BNSF tracks for scale. Um, it's a steep slope. Most of these bluffs are about 45 degrees. Um, and in this case, it's about 150, 175 feet high. I mentioned the geology there is this glacial sequence, again, quite similar to what you have in Minneapolis, of till on the top, big package of sand, and then uh, a lacustrine unit, a finer grain unit below that. But the slides really are involved in this mechanically weathered colluvium that overlies the more, uh, the better consolidated glacial deposits. Um, and the, the slides in this area, if we look back historically, typically occur in response to these big systems that are atmospheric rivers that they're calling them now, pineapple expresses in the local colloquial term, um, where you've got rainfall that lasts for quite a number of hours um, that may bring, oh, two, three, four inches of rain kind of thing. Um, the instrumentation that we're using at this particular site, we've changed what we do now, but this is the basic idea. Rain gauges, water content profilers, this gives us a, a, a measurement, an indirect measurement of the water content at a number of depths down to typically two meters in this environment. Um, tensiometers, which measure negative pore water pressures or soil suction. Um, in this particular location, we had 12 of those in two nests. And the data for these are logged on site and transmitted, which used to be kind of nifty, but now is a standard thing to do. Um, there was a shallow landslide at this site where we had the instrumentation. That's me sort of for scale on the photograph on the left-hand side and some, some sketches of where the instruments were located and the slide itself. And that map just shows that the, we had instrumentations in the slide body, coincident with the failure surface and just outside. And those data turned out to be really interesting. And the, the, main, in, the main thing that came out of that, and I'll cut to the chase on that, that lower graph there is that we didn't observe positive pore water pressures when the slide occurred. This was a clue that we needed to better understand the processes that are going on in the unsaturated zone, which turns out to be really challenging, and I won't go into great detail about that. But just to summarize this set of charts here, on the upper right-hand figure, we've got hourly rainfall from September 05 till January um, of 06 when the slide occurred. The red arrow there indicates the landslide at our location. Um, we've interpreted the soil moisture information into a degree of saturation by taking account of the soil porosity. And the takeaway message there is that water contents are high or greatest, lowest, lowest in the profile, so down a meter and a half or so. That's the red trace there. But they reach this sort of plateau in the wet season and, and then remain there. So this, there's really sort of a, a season, seasonality to the soil moisture regime in that area, which shouldn't be a surprise. It's dry in the summer and the fall, and it wets up, but it tends to stay wet once it gets wet. Um, the lowest graph is pore water pressure. Uh, these are all negative. This is soil suction. These are negative pressures. So then, then they're negative, quite negative in the 
fall and the summer, and then they reduce in the wintertime with onset of the rainfall, but then they kind of bounce around near zero throughout that time. And so the, the key is how do you interpret this, because we've got a long period there where it's sort of bouncing around zero, how do we interpret this in terms of slope stability? And we spent a fair bit, and I won't go into the sort of geotechnics that are involved in this, we spent a, quite a bit of effort with collaboration with colleagues at the Colorado School of Mines to develop a framework that can be used in a standard geotechnical analysis to assess the unsaturated factor of safety, if you will. And that's what we've got across that lower graph, graph E there, is a factor of safety is a function of time, again, over our rainfall sequence. The landslide occurred where the red arrow is shows there. And at the lowest depth at about 1.5 meters from our analysis here, we've got a factor of safety of about one. And from a geotechnical analysis, that means we are in the partially stable zone. The challenge here, though, is we've got a factor of safety of one for a very long period of time, about two weeks. Um, and so what does that mean? How do, how do we better, we, we need to do more work to better understand what actually sort of pushed, what was the last straw that broke the camel's back, if you will? And that, that turned out to be a real challenge. Um, we have done some work with numerically modeling these things. We can reproduce the field observations fairly well if we can characterize the material properties well with a simple 1D numerical infiltration model, so 1D solution to Richard's equation. Um, that's what I'm showing on the right hand, so we'll focus on the right hand graph there. That's factor of safety, one is unstable. Um, that's the, the period that where we, things are sort of bouncing around one. Um, the field data are the red, the solid traces and the models are the dash data, then, you know, we can do a pretty good job of reproducing that information, um, but we still can't produce, we still can't pinpoint the precise moment when it moves. But this does, if used operationally, this would provide the track operators and whomever else needed this information to say, okay, you're in the critical zone, if you will, um, and you should be concerned. If it, if it rains hard going forward, um, you might have some problems. We've taken that understanding and put it into a spatially distributed model. This is an example of that model. This is the, that same area of Puget Sound Bluffs, but we're looking at a map view now. And across the top row is a prediction of pressure head or pore water pressure at uh, 1.5 meters depth as a function of time. So we can produce this on a regular you know, PC computer. And then the, the bottom row there is a factor of safety. Factor of safety are one. In this case, we're showing them as those uh, purple colors. And then we've got a number of landslides outlined there in that last frame from a storm in 1996, 97. So the take home from this is that we have a tool that's been developed. We're in process now of trying to take this the next step, which means from a research effort to an operational effort. Um, and we've been in discussion with folks at NCAR and elsewhere about how to do that. Um, we have some colleagues in Italy who, who actually are running this operationally now as part of an early warning system for debris flow activity there. Um, so we're kind of behind the curve in some ways. Um, going forward, and just to summarize, is, you know, from an op operational landslide, is it possible I mean, I think it's conceptually possible for limited areas with well-defined needs. That means rail corridors, transportation corridors, places where there's uh, elements at risk. And when we talk about the post-fire landscape, that's some, somewhat different. Um, you all have done a fantastic job of improving the accuracy and quantitative estimates of heavy rainfall, um, and, that, and that provides us at least an impetus and some motivation to say, can we go forward with this? Um, I do think, though, that the neo-real-time hydrologic data to provide initial conditions for the hydrologic model and the flexibility model are critical. So that means, you know, a, a, a significant investment to actually make this happen. We have, and I, I didn't speak about this at all, but we've developed this, a set of testing protocols at the Colorado School of Mines to determine the pro soil properties that need to go into these models. We've made that far more efficient than it used to be. Um, so, so that's a real advance as well, and this allows us to account for the effects of the unsaturated zone, and that's critical to estimating these things. Going forward, there's a lot to be done, um, and that last one, 
I'll just highlight is that partnerships with folks like you all are critical to making this a reality. And with that, I'll wrap up and happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, do we have any questions from the field offices, from the phone callers? Yeah, I have a question. This is Mark in Monterey. Hey, Mark. Hi, Mark. All right, great talk, John. Um, question about your factor of safety diagram. Um, I suppose this is probably the first thing you thought of when you saw that, but I don't know if you have enough data points. Is there kind of a critical time over which the factor of safety is reached that, that may be the threshold, the relevant threshold? That's a really great question. Um, and my instinct is, and I will say it's just an instinct that it's material dependent, that when we're looking at sort of the sandy materials like we have in Seattle, um, that that time that it needs to be over that threshold is somewhat less than it would be, say, in the clay-rich materials in the, in the you know, coast ranges there in your neck of the woods. Um, but honestly, we haven't looked at that carefully, but that is a, uh, this linkage between slope stability or the state of stress, if you will, and displacement really isn't well captured by these limit equilibrium models and its other models that simulate the state of stress and displacement that are probably needed to make advances in that area. But yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I, yeah, I um, didn't mean to suggest they would be universal. I was thinking they'd, if you had enough monitoring points up there along that rail line in that um, yep. hill overlying the, the sands that you could maybe identify a, a duration for that factor of safety to, to hit a threshold. But I'm thinking that, you know, in areas like that, you know, it might be that, that uh, you know, the condition, the subsurface conditions are right and primed after a while, and it's just a cascade to chaos at some point. And the question is, when does that cascade begin? Yeah, no, that, that, that's, a, that's a, I think, a really good way to put it. And um, what, we have, what we're going forward with right now along that rail line is, is installing another set of instruments um, to actually measure uh, stress, which turn, is a challenge in and of itself. But, but we're, you know, pushing in that direction. But I do think that you're right that, that there is a, uh, that there may be a, a link between the limit equilibrium, the time when you're uh, below one or around one, and then when something occurs. I mean, that's a, I think that's a way to, to think about it. That's a great question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Uh, we may be talking more with this coming El Nino. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, this is Regina Cabrera, Southeast River Forecast Center. Um, I have a question for you in the international area. Uh, you were talking about some of these uh, studies, and I would like to know if you're familiar with anything that has to do, you just mentioned El Nino, and in countries such in South America, such as Bolivia, Chile, Peru, you get a lot of this mad flow. Do you know, or, or what would you say would be for these countries to uh, initiate something towards having more knowledge and, and apply this, this type of techniques? Because the instrumentation here, you can uh, have it to some level, but in these other countries that have a lot of those processes, uh, there are a lot of fatalities because they don't have anything. So where would you start? Uh, <coughs> That's another, another great question. Um, and I'm not, so the, the landslide program and I would say the volcano hazards program haven't worked a whole lot on landslide issues in uh, sort of the northern, northern South America. But we have collaborated quite a long time with um, groups in El Salvador and Nicaragua and some of the Latin American countries. Um, and the approach that they've they've taken largely is, has been sort of the first strategy that I mentioned is less from an early warning standpoint, more from an avoidance standpoint. So using primarily topography, because that, those are the data that are available, to identify locations in the landscape that have where landslides that have occurred or debris flows, mud flows have occurred in the past, and then just trying to, trying to stay away from that, which is a real 
I mean, an extremely difficult thing where, where poverty and land use sort of intersect to create really, really bad situations. Um, I'm most familiar with El Salvador, and, um, and, and that's just, <clears throat> I'm not sure what the, what the next step is, really, to be honest. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, hey, uh, Dr. Gott, this is uh, Dave from the uh, Alaska Pacific RFC. Um, hey, Dave. I know we talked to you a while back regarding uh, uh, our southeast Alaska landslide uh, issues, and the question I have is, is there some sort of mandate at a state level or or somewhere regarding just archiving landslide activity in, uh, you know, highway corridors or, you know, above a certain size. Um, the reason being we've contacted uh, the state of Alaska and they kind of said, well, talk to the USGS uh, or the Forest Service, which does have a little bit. But um, is that a, is something you guys do or is, um, you know, just to see a current relative to, you know, rainfall rates or, or something to that matter? Another great question. Um, the, to my knowledge, none of the states have a mandate, so a legislative mandate to do that type of work. Several of the states, their state geological surveys that have um, hazards programs, California comes to mind, North Carolina, um, Colorado, Utah, do at least informally keep track of landslide occurrence. Um, but to my knowledge, they're very, all those databases, so to speak, are, are incomplete. And sort of the nature of the problem tends towards that. Um, landslides occur every day somewhere in the United States, and almost none of them are captured by anything. Because they happen out in the woods, and you know, that, if they don't do any damage, nobody really pays any attention. Some of the best records, at least in my experience, are usually kept by state highway departments because they tend to deal with the problem um, more than anyone else sort of on a regular basis. Um, we just met with the folks, the Minnesota Department of Transportation, and uh, he pointed out a really interesting thing to me is because most of those issues are related in some way to road engineering of one flavor or another, that the engineers themselves, both Department of Transportation and the private sector, are sort of reluctant to tell anybody because and typically these are failures of things that they've built, right? And so they kind of keep that kind of on the down low. Um, but uh, unfortunately, at both the state and federal level, the, there's no one tasked with keeping track of landslide occurrence. And even if there was, um, the problem itself would be a challenge. So I hate to be the, the wet blanket there, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like like we were saying, you know, we still sometimes try to provide a little information in our in our products down there with big rainfall events that the potential exists for landslides, but we want to know if we have any skill or whether we should even be doing it, and it's just a, a challenge. Um, yeah, and I've spoken with a number of the hydrologists at the you know uh, at the WFOs, and I, I increasingly see, and, and I think it's a good thing that language in flash flood products in particular that has says, you know, landslides are possible or debris flows are possible or mudslides are possible. And I, I mean, I think that's fine. It raises awareness about it, but I, but I think you're right. You know, is, what's that based on other than it's raining like hell and it, maybe, <laughs> and you know, we, we, we're working in a few select areas, but I'll, you know, honestly, we're, it'll take at this rate, it'll be, well beyond my lifetime before we have something like a national system. <laughs>